were pregnant with our first child at that point. And I remember that I emptied our bank account of all the Bitcoin machines I could buy. Baby came out. I remember telling my wife, oh yeah, I kind of spent all our money <laughs> on Bitcoin mining machines, you know. <laughs> but in the end of the day, it was all worth it. Adani Abiodun, the co-founder and CPO at Mistin Labs, the company behind the SUI network. A layer one blockchain and smart contract platform designed to make digital asset ownership fast, secure, and accessible. What is Mistin Labs? Mistin Labs is effectively a lab, but our goal is to build platforms and protocols to make the internet more decentralized. So you moved to Facebook, right? And then you were part of a team that was working on something called Libra. What was Libra? Libra was a very, very ambitious project where Facebook put together a consortium that built a blockchain. Why did the Facebook Libra project not work? Um. If you wake up tomorrow morning and two billion people have a bank account, the bank of Facebook, it's the biggest bank ever. That's scary. So I think for any nation state, that's a problem. What is SWE Network if you had to explain it to your mother? SWE gives a very simple piece of infrastructure to reduce the cost for you to send money or send value. It is what the internet needs to make sending money easier across the board. You told me crypto hasn't delivered for too long, right? How is SWE Network solving this issue? I think crypto is largely undelivered because the developer platforms are not expressive enough for developers to build really compelling applications. So we had to build a much more safe paradigm for people to work with. What is Bitcoin and crypto to you? Bitcoin for me is 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development and community events. You mentioned uh, that's a really nice way to start actually uh that you're sharing with Evan, these kind of interviews, right? And uh, because there's so many things to do, obviously, yeah. and then you have th uh, so we're, you're five co-founders that you have to share tasks, right? Yeah. And you don't know how you would do with one single founder. And that's actually, there's a few points here. It's so interesting because first it's true, like being solo founder is probably extremely hard, right? Very lonely. But, if, and very lonely. But yeah. have you done it before, being a solo founder? I've been a solo founder before. Yeah, and I ended up taking up help later on in the process. But like, it's a lot of mental work, right? You got to build a product, you got to excite people, you got to get people on board, mm -hmm. you got to make sure the company's going the right direction. Then you got to delegate. It's a lot of work. I think I don't know how people do it, but I'm really grateful we have five co-founders for our company. Um, I actually don't think Miston would exist if we didn't have the mix that we have. Mm -hmm. Like, it's literally impossible. Right, it's literally impossible. But you kind of went on the kind of other extreme of the spectrum, right? Yeah. Which is, which is hey, like, I could have, okay, solo founder is extremely hard. You could have a co-founder or two? Look, you're it, five and you said, hey, like, this could usually be a disaster. Which look, I, it, look, having a co-founder could also be a pain, right? Because mm -hmm. you might not like each other. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, adding three, it's you're increasing the risk with more and more people, more characters, more emotions, you know, different variants, right? And then we go to the extreme element of a scale of having five co-founders. Like it's, it could be, it could have been a, a disaster. No, quite frankly, it could have been an absolute disaster. I think what really, really helped us is the fact that we had all worked together um, on various projects at Facebook on Libra. Mm -hmm. And we all have different skills that we bring to the table. Um, Evan's an amazing, phenomenal leader, great visionary. Um, he led the R&D team at Meta. Um, I'm a product person, or a product background. Also used to be an engineer, but I, I, my strength is working on product, literally growing the product vision, building a team around that. Operations as well. Like I'm, a, I'm an operator. I can operate businesses, right? That's always been my past experience. And then you have Sam, who's a smart contracts. I mean, a programming languages expert. You have George, who builds all our algorithms and the uh, consensus expert, and you have Costas, who's our cryptographer. Like mm. in crypto, to build a layer one, it takes more than one discipline and one skill. 
I think this is why, like, we've our thesis has always been that you've not seen much innovation in crypto just because it's not been that multidisciplinary. It's it's been always one focus. If you look at the team makeup, right? There's always one team who's really, really good at programming languages, but mm. suck at everything else. Mm. A one team who f- focuses on having the best consensus algorithm, but you can't build a developer stack on top of it. A one team who's great at developer stack, but really lacks in everything else, right? So I think one thing we do really, really well is that we really go to the sense of using the vast... Um, breadth of the skills that come from all the founders and we build a team around each one of us, right? So I think that's really helped. It could have been a disaster, but I think it's actually been our strengths. And we were able to bake that friendship and that relationship and that camaraderie at Facebook before coming to build a company together. I think if we just met each other overnight, it would not be the same thing. So no, I'm, I'm really grateful. Like, I, I, again, I don't know how anyone else does it. One of the biggest uh, causes for business failure actually is co-founder issues, right? Yeah. It's not talked about much, but it's actually very, very, very well documented. Yeah. Have you ever had like some really big arguments in the team? Um, we've, we have disagreements, but we've never had anything that has not been resolved. Mm. Um, I think one thing we do have is really a shared vision of what we're trying to achieve. And we started with that vision, like we want to make the internet better. Mm. It's always been, look, companies, the way the internet works today, companies like Facebook, Google end up building large monopolies it's really really unfair and i think if we can democratize the internet we think you could build new businesses on top of a fully democratized internet so the internet lacks a democratization layer for coordinating assets and we saw that at facebook right while we're trying to build it while being at facebook we saw what the potential impact could be and leaving libra with that vision we expanded the vision beyond just saying hey let's make sending money as easy as email it's guys let's just build a better internet And that vision really helps us prioritize when it comes to decision making. So the mission here, if I reformulate it with, is build a better internet. Build a better democratized internet. What does that mean? So the internet today is greater moving packets of data around, right? If I want to send you an email, if I want to store a picture, it's great at doing that. But it's not good at basically transferring value or intent across the internet. So if I want to share money with you, mm. we have a spaghetti ball of different protocols to do it that don't really give us much finality. And then it also incentivizes large, um, I think I kicked the mic, incentivizes large, um, again, monopolies again, right? You have these payment companies um, or PSPs who largely commoditize most of the payment rails. And you don't have, it's not open in a large extreme, right? So what we think is if you build a layer that allows you to build the ability to coordinate assets across the internet without central bodies, then you can allow people to build new payments businesses. You allow people to build new storage businesses, people to build new social media companies. Because now the, you know, you don't have a company that's judge, jury, and executioner is what I always say, right? Like Facebook is judge, jury, and executioner. They decide who's on the platform, decide what the fees are. They decide what your portion and ownership of the data is. And it's because it's just more efficient for them to do it that way, right? I'm not saying Facebook is an evil company. I'm just saying just by proxy of how the internet is built, it would eventually tend to a way where they end up commoditizing, they end up really owning that data and owning the users. I think if you build a layer that allows the Facebooks of the world or other people to come in and... Something just fell on the floor there. <laughs> <laughs> Too impressed by the, it, the, the it, mission. It, it fell down. It just felt, it loved our mission so much that it dropped <laughs> to the ground. Um, but if you imagine, right, like now anybody can write a smart contract that has a new business idea and can really just now give you a new way to exchange value with less fees without having to entrust your data to them. I think you open up new doors. It's also scary, right? Because this is why people are worried about crypto to a large extreme. Decentralization seems like a very new territory, but we think it's it's actually the exciting frontier of the future. You're one of the five co-founders of Mistern Labs, which is building the Sui network. Who are you? If I had to start, I grew up in Nigeria. I was born and raised in Nigeria. Well, I say born and raised, but I left when I was eight years old. Um, parent to two Nigerian parents. I'm um, sorry, this child to, new, to Nigerian parents. Um, and my, my dad went to do his PhD in Scotland. So me and my family, we moved over to Scotland, um, stayed there for six years, had a very strong Abadonian accent, mm. um, which is weird. You know, you got this 
kid from Nigeria speaking like a Scot. <laughs> it's very weird. Then we moved to London after my dad finished his PhD and then lived in London for most of my life, actually. Um, went to school, Queen Mary University in London, studied electronic engineering. I actually wanted to be an astrophysicist. Mm. I started my course, I actually started with astrophysics. And within two weeks, I was like, there's no way I'm going to make money being an astrophysicist. Let me, let me do something a bit more serious. So I jumped out of astrophysics and then I, I went into electronic engineering with computing. And, you know, that's where my love for computers, my love for programming, my love for, um, you know, building software really, really grew. Um, from there, after graduating, I actually went, started building software and hardware to monitor oil wells remotely. Um, then I jumped into finance, uh, started building trading systems, trading algos and risk management systems as well. I, I was at JP Morgan, HSBC. Um, building such systems. It was a lot of fun, but that was the time also where I found about Bitcoin. Mm. You know, this amazing technology. I first read the paper from one of my colleagues and I thought the thing was a bit of a scam. I was like, this doesn't make much sense till I looked at the code and then I read the paper again. I'm like, man, like all these systems we built in banks, it was great if we all had, I don't know why the idea of a single ledger shared didn't like, it, it didn't immediately resonate. But then, you know, after taking a bit more time to look at it, like all these systems were built in banks. We were building these amazing reconciliation systems just because we didn't have a single view of the world. Uh, it just made a lot of sense to me. So I went all in on, in crypto back then. This was 2012. Mm -hmm. Went all in. I started building my own mining farms in my house till my wife told me to get the machines out of the house because there's no spare room anymore. <laughs> it's just these machines running over and over again mining Bitcoin. So I started renting data center space, built my mining company as a result. It was just accidental. I was doing it for myself, getting out of the house. And after a while, people started paying me to do it for them. And then I set up a Bitcoin mining business by accident as a result. So you spend a lot of time in the UK, right? Yeah. What's the most English or British thing that you find yourself still doing every day, even after living in the USA for more than 10 years? Uh, watching football. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans call it soccer, but I'm sorry, it's football. Um, this is the real football. The guys. real football. The real football. <laughs> I love Barcelona, I love Real Madrid, but um, if I had to pick, I, Catalonia all the way. Um, I love Arsenal. It's my favorite team. Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal. The team's broken my heart for the last 15 years. <laughs> Can't win it That's something I never understood. Actually, I, I lived in Highbury in Slington when I lived in... A, in uh, London, yeah. so right beside the stadium. Oh, right? yeah. And um, I never understood, I mean, I understand that you can be a diehard fan, but at some point, like, you should throw the towel. We, we, are, the the most, towel. we are the most loyal people ever. Marry yeah. an Arsenal fan. <laughs> I'm telling you, they'll never leave you, <laughs> no matter what you do. <laughs> We're the most loyal people. It's, 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 been a, it's been a disaster, but I think the team's <laughs> looking better now, but we say that every year. Um, yeah, but I, I love, I love, Football, I love boxing. Those are my two big passions. There's something between, uh, there's a big parallel here between uh, Arsenal fan is going to get better and uh, Ethereum price action. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I think people we probably... are like, it's going to get better. We just reached the bottom. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. And it's never, right? I change it. Marry an Arsenal or an ETH fan. Those two. Those are, they'll, they'll be very, Ideally, very an Arsenal plus ETH, <laughs> plus ETH fan, fan. And then like you're set for Ultim forever. Ultimate. Ultimate. <laughs> ETH alignment, as they say, you know. <laughs> Probably a good co-founder too, right? Because the loyalty is probably one of the... Loyal to the mission. Yeah. Loyal to the mission. I think it's a resolute in the vision, like, but loyal to the mission is what I would say, you know. Yeah. That's that's what we're doing. That's It's an interesting world. Um, I still... People said that I, I now have a bit of an American twang, which I always reject, but maybe it is. Why? Probably because I spent last <laughs> almost 10 years in America. But why do you reject it? <sighs> what do you not like about America? No, <laughs> that's a good question, actually. No, no, no. Because, do you know, I, America was never a place I wanted to, it was never in my mind I was going to move to America. Mm. Like, I had no interest in moving to America. I loved the UK. I mean, I loved our horrible weather. I love the fact that you had two days you of summer. You love pain. That's another I great co-founder trait. There you go. You're, and, you're and, learning. And husband trait. <laughs> love pain, be loyal. Oh my love God. Love ETH, love Arsenal. We'll, we'll deal with misery with, with like, <laughs> like, bring more, bring more. So, no, I think I, I had a very, I have a very strong affiliation with the UK. I, I do love the UK, right? Mm. Like, all jokes aside, I love being in the UK. It's just, 
when my business started to grow in crypto and then most of my customers were in America, I, it made sense to move to America. Mm. And I thought, oh, I'll be there for a couple of years and I'll move back. But uh, <laughs> I'm not going back at this point in time. So I don't know. I think it's just, um, it, it's almost rejecting the truth to a large extent. I think it's, I fi- I'm going to be here for forever. I don't it's the same as the Arsenal story. story. You're just rejecting the truth. Rejecting the truth of never winning a title <laughs> again. But this year will be our year. I'm telling you, this year will be our year. I, I can smell it. You're staying here, obviously, because there's more opportunities. Why do you think, I mean, we're recording this from San Francisco, right? Bay Area. Why do you think there is so much that... I was yesterday talking to, a, I mean, I, I live in Singapore. I had this friend of mine who also <laughs> is from Singapore and he's now part of the Y Combinator here, right? Yeah. For Mito Health, a, a longevity company. And he was saying, man, I'm moving here. Yeah. I'm moving here. I have to. Like, there's nothing... There's nothing in Asia, there's nothing in Singapore, there's nothing in London, there's nothing. Like, I need to be here. Why? And you worked at Facebook, right? Yeah. So why do you think everything in tech or a lot is happen- is happening here and is from here? Because, you know, if, if you if you walk around, it's kind of like, it's a normal place. It's kind of, it's not a big city. It's, what's so special here? Yeah, I, I would just say, look, Before even going into the big into the Bay Area, because I want to talk about that as well, like there's a there's a certain magic about America, and I hate having to say it. It sounds like this, like I'm trying to paint this picture, but it's true. It's like true. I built a company in the UK, I had to leave to grow it in America. The UK is not really friendly for entrepreneurs. It's mm. just not mm. like the idea of setting up your own company. If you set up your own company, you must be a failure <laughs> or something's not working, right? Like just the idea of building something from scratch rather than going to work for the establishment. It's very, very, it's not the normal case in the UK. And I find here there's such a real entrepreneurial spirit. I think if you come to the Bay Area, you have it times 20, right? Like it's, mm. it's an order of magnitude different, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's an area that's very, very passionate about building something new, always willing to take the risks. Like if you think about even the laws in America related to bankruptcy, the idea that you could fail and start again, great. Try that in the UK, right? Like it's really encouraging you to take risks and mm. rebuild and rebuild again. So I think that's a powerful thing about about America as a whole. But I think you have such a high concentration of that spirit yeah. in the Bay Area that you will not find in any other place. Everywhere has tried to replicate it. And I think, great, keep throwing money at it. But beyond the money, it's the spirit that comes with it. There's a spirit of excellence that, that you just have in the Bay Area that I, I've not seen anywhere else I've been. I've traveled to so many countries while being in crypto. Is a culture basically, right? It's yeah. Like the company wants the culture is built pretty pretty hard to change it, right? Absolutely. And I mean, yeah. I'm from Switzerland where it's very, they, they love to say in these rankings, oh, we're a very innovative country. I moved to Singapore. Oh, we're extremely innovative. We're <laughs> investing in all that stuff. But yeah. if you just go back to the roots, which is a family, right? Or a household, what are your parents going to be proud of yeah. when you grow up is, oh, if you're an accountant or if you're a lawyer or if you're a banker Correct. or if you're a consultant, right? Correct. which is not a bad thing, yeah. but it's the complete polar opposite of innovation, right? Correct. And so yeah. I just, I, I was in New York before coming here and then I came here and just like, you just feel the energy. You're like, fuck, it's, <laughs> something it's, is different. It's different. I, it's I was different. In, the, in the UK, remember I was, I saw it in oil and gas, right? And then I had to pivot to banking. Okay, where's the next place where money's going to come from? Banking's what pays the most. So I pivoted into banking. In fact, my dad's an economist. My brother's an economist. My family is mostly in the financial sector, right? In terms of their mindset. And that's where I went to. The idea of starting a company was never remotely the first option. Mm. It was always, oh, maybe something in the future. Mm. But over here, like everybody's thinking, okay, what am I going to do? You should have a company that you start on the side to some extent. I think that the mindset and the culture is, is very different here in the Bay. And it's probably everything, right? Because most of the people who who ask, ah, oh, I want to start something, but I don't know what, etc. Like the, the the real answer to that is just start. Just yeah. just start, right? Yeah. But to to just start, which might sound sound or feel like a huge step for someone, if you have an environment that is just saying, That's awesome, you should do it, you should start, you should try, blah, blah, blah. Like it's 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 like the difference between starting and not starting, right? Just yeah. having this. This, this, these people around you who are actually very 
optimistic about whatever my idea you might have, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm recently investing in an AI company, a, med, a biotech AI company in, in the UK. And I looked at their financials like, wait, you guys are already profitable and you're trying to raise an A? I'm like, it's crazy. Try that in the Bay. I'm like, you guys would be way more valuable here. Your, your contributions would be way more highly valued in the US. Maybe I should get them over to the US. Mm. But I found that the invent, investment mindset there is very, very different as well. So if mm. you think about how capital is even allocated, it's very restrictive. So it's all different here. And I, and I think it's, it's hard to replicate because I think it's a culture thing. Mm. It's not just a money thing. You could, Middle East has lots of money. Saudi Arabia has lots of money. But there's an element of a culture that's very inherent here that it's very hard to replicate. I think it's what people need to try and try to find, you know. What made you leave the UK exactly 11 years ago? So I got to a point where my biggest orders for my service were coming from the US. This was a Bitcoin mining company, right? Correct. Correct. So I, I bought machines, I put them in data centers and people would pay me to rent the time on my machines and they get to keep the Bitcoin. I'll take a fee. Um, but most of my orders were coming from the US. And in fact, my supplier, my biggest supplier was in Texas. Mm. So the amount of money I was spending on both my suppliers and then earning income from the US, it made sense to park myself in the US mm. so I could grow the business. It was the right call in the end. It was meant to be a temporary six month move to try and work with a supplier while the machines got to production, but end up becoming something a lot more permanent. That's actually very interesting, you know, like you're saying it was supposed to be a six month move because a lot of people, for example, this uh, company that you said you wanted to invest or you, you invested in before, right? If you tell them, hey guys, you should move. Probably it's a huge step in their mind. I'm going to leave everything, my yeah. friends, everything. No, if you break down, it's like a problem, right? Yeah. Let's have a start and try for three or six months. Right? Yeah. And then maybe extend another six months. Like yeah. there's a way to approach even things that sound big. Uh, same as starting a company. Absolutely. Hey, just start. <clears throat> try three, six months. If it doesn't work, like maybe it's going to be like a, you do a six month holiday because you don't have a revenue, right? Yeah. But you're still trying something, right? Take it as a holiday where you're working, right? And figure it out. Yeah. And then. Yeah. It's not like, hey, you're just leaving your career and starting something new and can never come back, right? There is. But also, I'd, I'd also argue, like, what is the worst that can happen? That's the way I think, mm. right? Like, so if you fail, get another job. So when I, was, when I was going to start my Bitcoin company, when my Bitcoin company was running, I was working at a bank. And then I reached a point where, like, wait a minute, let me just go full on into this. My wife was not supportive. It's like, wait, we're, you're making good money at a bank. This is your doing well in your career. Why do you want to go and start a company? Mm. And, you know, I remember we were pr pregnant with our first child at that point. And I remember that I, I emptied our bank account for all the Bitcoin machines I could buy because these things were like gold dust back then. It was hard to buy, to get in the line to actually buy one. Entered our bank account. I remember telling my wife on the way to the airport while she was in labor, hey, I mean, on the way to the um, hospital while she was in labor, hey, by the way, um, I have to tell you about this Bitcoin thing that we're doing. Um, Baby came out, oh, yeah, I kind of spent all our money <laughs> on Bitcoin mining machines. And she's like, okay, you know what? We'll deal with this when we're back home. But it was a right, it was a right bet. I'll give you a slap <laughs> when I'm back home and have more, more energy. Don't do this. <laughs> But I was like, look, end of the day, you know, I've got some skills. I can go and work another bank if this whole thing falls over. So that was the mindset that I had, right? So jumped on a plane, went to America, things worked out. And I was like, look, babe, we've got to move because things are really going well here. Why don't we just move over to America? Get, I'll get the visa. Let's try it out for a couple of years. Six months turned to a couple of years and then a couple of years become permanent at this point in time. <laughs> so I always say like, look, you know, you could always, you have to look at it as if I don't take this move and things, if I take this move and things go wrong, is it recoverable? And most of the times it actually is. Most circumstances are recoverable. Um, Of course, don't do something stupid that's irrecoverable, yeah. but, but, but most of the times you have skills, you're smart, like you should be able to figure out to get another job. And that's how I look at it. I'm more of a risk taker in that regard. It's a calculated risk. It's a calculated basically. risk. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing with Miston, right? Like we could, we're doing really well at Facebook. Like there's no real need to jump out from a financial mm. point of view, mm. but we thought we could build something better. And worst case, it doesn't work out. Well, for us, to be honest, like we felt very confident in what we're building. Mm. That's why we're, we're very mission-driven. Worst case, you can go yeah. back to another company and figure things out. So 
I think we're now at the stage where it's no going back, it's no looking back. Sometimes the soul should be prioritized over the financial aspect, right? I mean, probably, Absolutely. probably most of the time. Most of the time. People don't uh, do it, yeah. Most of the time. What's the hidden economics behind the Bitcoin mining company? And the reason I'm asking yeah. that is, I received a pitch the other day from a friend of mine from 10 years ago. We went to school together. And he's like, I'm moving to Paraguay and I'm starting this Bitcoin mining company. And I'm not familiar with Bitcoin mining. I mean, not much. I had yeah. the Samir Tabar from uh, Bit Digital on the podcast like a long time ago, but yeah. I'm not really fa familiar with Bitcoin mining. But I suspect from kind of what I read and understand that it's not as easy as what people might think, it's not right? As easy as Especially a today, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, what are the hidden economics behind a Bitcoin mining company? So, the most important thing to remember is you're going to spend a lot of money on power. It's one thing for the expenditure to buy the machine, but then your ongoing cost of that machine will be the power cost. Then you've got to factor in the breakdown because these machines are run at the edge of what's possible. Mm. Like these, you know, most um, processes in your computer, you don't run it at optimal capacity all the time. But mining, you want to get the most hash rate as possible. Mm. So you're going to run the machine as hot as possible overclock it, whatever you need to do to get as many hashes as possible to make as much Bitcoin as possible. And you that ends up being wear and tear on the machine. So we actually had fans going breaking down. The fans go down, the machine's gone, right? Like there's so many things that can go wrong. You do liquid cooling, something leaks, you've broken the board. Like there's so many things that can go wrong that you need to also consider the ongoing maintenance, the ongo a team that's going to always maintain the hardware over and over again. How, so, How much of the whole kind of cost is maintenance, right? So back then cool. when I was doing it, yeah. I think I factored in at least 10 to 15% of my costs were really ongoing maintenance costs. Mm. That's minus the power and everything else. Um, and it varies also from machine to machine. Some manufacturers are better than others. Um, now, I've not been in Bitcoin mining for a while. I'm sure the machines are a lot, lot better today, but I, I'll still argue there will be some breakdown because everything's run at the edge. You know, so yeah, power costs will only tell you one thing and a hardware acquisition costs only tell you another. You want to dig into what have you budgeted for ongoing maintenance? What is the expertise of a team that can monitor it? Do you have automated monitoring machines that can effectively tell you when something is down and you can reboot it? The, these are the kind mm -hmm. of things because every time a machine's down, you're not mining, you're not making money. You need a way to automate that. And sometimes... These machines don't want to reboot. You have to go and do something hard by, uh, by hand. And we had so many of that. It was very expensive. How we easy would you say it would be for anyone today to start and be competitive in the Bitcoin mining industry? Today, so, 2024. So you, if you have low power and, um, um, and you can buy the hardware for a decent price and you're not trying to scale and you can just run it in your house, no problem. Right? If you're not trying to scale, if you're just going to run one machine in your house, mm. all that matters is the cost of electricity is less than the cost of roll. That you can make more money mining Bitcoin than the cost of electricity. And over time, you amortize that to the hardware cost. You'll be fine. But try to put five machines together, 20 machines together, 100 machines together. The economics changes dramatically. So I think at scale is where the problems start to really become um, um, interesting. But as a hobbyist, you could go ahead. You could do it. You make some money, but it's not going to be life-changing. Do you think today there's the same problem as in the tech industry, right? It's a few monopolies in the Bitcoin mining industry, so it's almost impossible to come and, and become better and be competitive? Or do you think it's different and it's still possible? I think as an, as an individual miner, if you think about how Bitcoin works, right? Like the more hash rate you have, the more chance you have of min winning blocks on mm. a regular basis. Whereas if you have one piece of hardware, maybe in 100 years, you might mine a block, right? So I think it, it, it almost encourages because of pooled mining and because people build mining pools, mm. you're forced to create concentrated um, concentrated pools of, of Bitcoin mines to, to be more effectively, to, to regularly generate revenue. So the lower your hash rate, the less likely your clients are going to receive a reward and they're, they're going to get pissed. If you're telling them we only wind a block every three months, they're going to say, well, why am I waiting every three months? I'm going to go to a pool who's bigger that can pay me on a weekly basis. Mm. So it does encourage that coordination of people coming together to mine in a centralized way. And that's not going to change anytime soon. It's always going to be a problem. I remember back in the day, there was a pool called, um, 
CEX.io, they controlled about 51% of the mining of the Bitcoin network. Mm. We had a meeting. I actually I remember myself and Gunn from Avalanche. Mm. We're actually in a meeting with a lot of the mining pools and we're talking about this problem. Guys, like 51% doesn't make sense. Can you tone it down or can you just stop accepting connections back then? So this was like, think about it, That's almost like centralized activity to mm. a large extent, right? People coming together and say, look, this is not healthy for Bitcoin. Let's tone it down. This is 2020, 2013, I believe. Mm. I believe it was 2013. That's the first time I met Gunn from um, AVAX at the time as well. But yeah, look, it's, it is largely centralized from my side. Um, but I still, I'm, a, I'm still a Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin holder. Still love Bitcoin. Always love Bitcoin. I think that that technology is not going to be upgraded for the next ten years. I don't think. Hey, when shift happens, family, time to toast our partner Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. You told me that you experienced a burnout once. Why? Yeah, um, my I've never experienced a career burnout until I worked at VMware, actually. Um, I just felt like this was a time when I felt like I, I took on more responsibility in a very short space of time just because it was there's so much work to do. Mm. Um, I found myself working on marketing, eng, product. Like I was, I was doing so much travel, you name it, conferences. It was a lot to do for one person. But I, for me, I was very driven on. We have to be the best. We're still behind. We have to be the best. We've got to get this out as fast as possible. So I'll drive myself to the ground to make sure that we win. Like I hate losing. Mm. I'm a, I'm a bad loser. <laughs> so, you know. But I burnt myself out in six months, literally six months. To the point when I went to Facebook, it felt like a piece of cake, right? It felt like a cakewalk to a large degree. But yeah, that, I, I, that was the first time in my career that I literally experienced a career burnout. What do you mean by I burnt myself out in six months? What happened? You what happens when you're burnt out? You can't work 20 hours a day, like six, you know, five, six, seven days in a row. It's just not, it's not possible. Mm. And then you lose your weekends as well, right? Like you can't do that. And I found myself constantly doing that, right? There's a drive to catch up. There's a drive to like, there's this element of like, okay, we've built a good team. We're behind. We're new entrants to this market. We need to show product market fit fast. If we don't, they'll shut down the program. But also we have multiple teams ahead of us. We need to make sure that we take our technology to market fast so we can show progress. So I think I took a lot of that onto my shoulder and I wanted to win so bad that I drew myself to the ground in that regard. So it wasn't odd to find myself working 20 hour days. I'll be working on the car onto the, into the office. I'll be working on my drive back home, get home back on the computer working again. Different time zones, you know. Brutal. Dealing with Tel Aviv office. Dealing, like I would be always working. I think that's, that was a problem. Um, not sustainable. Do you think that the burnout is more from working too much? or taking on too many tasks that, you don't, that you're not passionate about? So it was, I was definitely passionate about what we're working on. I don't think it's, I, I know about that where people are working on things they don't really care about. I, I just find that if I'm working on something soul crushing, I leave. I, I'll check out very quickly. I, I, I can't tolerate it. I get bored quickly. Um, but I did enjoy the job. I enjoyed what I was doing. I found it interesting, found it innovative. Um, it was certainly, me taking on too much, but also not taking a longer term view mm. on success. Mm. I took a, I, I basically equated failure as something that would happen within a six month, seven month window, rather than seeing as a longer term um, focus. But I think also, you know, you're responsible for revenue as well, right? Like, you know, if you own the book of revenue, you want to show revenue fast so that you can keep the life of a project on, you have a team behind you, you want to make sure that the project can grow and add more capacity. So I think that that was always a, it's, it's also like the dilemma of an entrepreneur, like an entrepreneur in your mindset, right? Like you, you've got staff to pay, yeah. although you're behind a big company, right? In, in the VMware scenario, you've got staff to pay. You want to make sure that the staff will always be taken care of. So yeah, like that's the added pressure from my, from my point of view. Probably something that's underappreciated by a lot of people who are employees and 
just get the salary paid at the end of the month. The salary comes from actual revenue that needs to come in. Not only revenue, but the cash needs to come, yeah. right? People need to pay, need et cetera, to pay. right? Which is another big problem of yeah. the entrepreneur, yeah. which is, okay, cool, I sold this thing, but like you're three months late, you're six months late, hey, I have people to pay every month yep. and many other things to pay. And so the, 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 the salary on the 25th or whatever date it is here, in the Bay Area is not uh, coming from the sky, but it's coming from actual revenue and actual cash flow. Yeah. People that can't deal with uncertainty shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Mm. And people that can't deal with uncertainty should probably rethink working in a startup. Right? <laughs> Those are the two things. If you deal with like things that are a bit vague, if you can't deal with things that are vague, just don't work in a startup. Don't work as an entrepreneur. Try and go to defined areas where have been around for a long time. I think I'm very comfortable in the unknown, very comfortable in figuring things out. And I think most of our team is, right? Like over time, it's hard to trust you. Okay, they say this is going to happen. Maybe it's taken a bit of time, but we've succeeded before. We'll succeed again. So you have to build that history and memory with your team. So to show credit, I call that credibility, right? It's part of building credibility to a large extent, you know. How, how comfortable are you with certainty? It's boring. <laughs> what happens to you when you feel bored? I check out. Like, Do you have an example in your career where you just checked out and had bank, to Bank, at the bank. Mm. Right? It, it's very predictable. I, I know what I'm... I, I could tell you from the time I woke up to the time I'm going to leave. Like, I could literally tell you <laughs> what I was going to do, what train I was going to take, who I was going to see at the door, who's going to be sat down before I sat down what I'm going to write, how I'm going to do my tests, how I'm going to check in the code, what the trader is going to say about the new um, improvement I've made before I go home. I could tell you all that. Mm. It was so predictable, right? Sounds, sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> but that's for the some life people. Of, some people love it, right? But like, I, 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 it's just not me. Yeah, it's just yeah. not me. Um, and people literally fight to fight and fight to get to that level where they can work on that kind of software, right? Mm. That was a pinnacle in banking in the, in the UK. That wasn't that wasn't for me. Um, that was it. Like even even any banking job I had, it became predictable within like the first two to three months. Like you'd already sussed all the problems. It wasn't there wasn't any new challenge, mm. right? It was just maintenance. And I cannot do a maintenance job. I cannot do one of those jobs at Facebook where I PM a product that is a checkout or I PM stories or reels or whatever, right? Like they're not. I can't get passionate about those problems. I think it's for other people. I can't get passionate about those problems because I can't see where my long-term value is going to be had, mm. where I can make a significant impact. I don't want 1% improvements, right? It needs to be 100x. It needs to be something that I could talk about and feel really proud of over and over again, which also means you're always going for home runs, which also means your likelihood of failure is probably high too. But that's where the well, that's where I think the magic is. To where do you think this comes from? It's kind of dry, fire in the belly, love for chaos, risk-taking. I don't know. Maybe it's always, I've always just been a compet competitive idiot. Like whether I'm on a field playing so, um, football, playing basketball, playing video games, I've always wanted to win. Mm. I've always wanted to win. And the win comes when it's a big win. I don't like like I beat you 1-0 in FIFA. Like I have to beat you 6-0. I have to be like, it has to be like, a, it has to be a big gap, right? And if I know I'm not going to win, I'm not going to play you. <laughs> I'll probably stay away. I'll, I'll play something else. But I think it, I don't know, maybe there's something in my childhood that, um, that it stems from. Have you thought about that? Probably not much because it's probably the first time I've, I've, I've dealt, you're becoming my shrink now. Like maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> Tell me about the time when. Um, <laughs> That's what we do here. We yeah, but, but, but maybe if you think about it as a, as a child, really, right? I wasn't always the top of the class. Mm. I wasn't always like the best at this or the best at that, right? And it always left me with a chip on my shoulder. Because um, I didn't try hard enough. I wasn't interested enough. I was like, okay, this wasn't, this isn't that interesting. So I'll go and do something else. Like I remember the night before my exams, right? I was, I was playing video games, right? I wasn't that interested. I wasn't, that, you know, like I didn't feel like it was challenging enough. So I didn't try hard enough, but also I didn't show up. And then I was like, okay, I screwed myself because I didn't apply myself, right? And then I probably overcorrected to the point where I'm going to over apply myself in everything that I do. Right. Everything I do, I'm going to put an extra effort. I want to make sure I definitely draw a line between myself and others. Mm. So 
perhaps that's where it comes from. You talk about chip on the shoulder is kind of funny because uh, I did a podcast maybe a week or two weeks ago in New York with Kiao Wang from Alliance Dao. Yeah. And he said, basically, we talked about the chip on the shoulder thing and that most of the big founders, they have big chip on the shoulder and things to prove, right? Yeah. Um, especially bad relationship with the dad or... Um, and he said that what they're looking for in founders is actually two things. <laughs> One is like a big degree of autism. Yes. <laughs> because you can think critically about the world, right? Take yeah. a step back and think critically and not be kind of a sheep, yeah. right? You don't follow the trend. You're just yeah. like thinking very, so the, the, the more autistic you are, the better for that. Yep. And the other one is probably a, a, a good childhood trauma. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So you just feel like you have this chip on the shoulder and you need to prove, right? And you're never stopping and you're always like pushing and working hard. It's so, funny you say that because I, I, I would also accredit that to Evan, our found our, our CEO, mm. exactly the same mindset. He's definitely got a big chip on his shoulder. Mm. And certainly, you know, what happened? To he him? wants to win. He wants to win all the time. Um, I mean, if you ask him, right, like if you think about what we did at the Libra Project, right, for me, he was by far the most knowledgeable about what we needed to do, what we needed to build, how it needed to be done. But it was not given, it, it was almost like those who were not as um, well versed in a topic and the area were given responsibilities that they shouldn't have been given. And I could see this. I'm literally sat there and I'm saying, like, why on earth are these guys making the decisions when clearly, you know, which is interesting when I joined Facebook, I started working on a project called Identity. Within three weeks, I'm like, this thing doesn't make sense. Why am I working on Identity? We don't have a blockchain, right? That thing got shut down very quickly. And I'm happy we shut that down. And I went to look for a new team. And I was looking for, okay, who are the crazies? And I was like, I want to work with the crazies. And I was looking for each, each team. Didn't want to work on the apps because I thought that was very easy and very... It's very basic. I don't think there's much innovation that could be had there. Didn't want to work on the infra team because really I thought the real infra was going to be the chain rather than all the monitoring. Didn't want to work. I mean, I ended up working with the research team and also the um, custody team as a result. And that's where I PM'd. I, I was a p partner with Evan on the research team and really worked with that team. And I was able to realize the brilliance of who we had hired. I remember telling you that one of my, uh, our best researcher at VMware got stolen by Facebook. Mm. And at that point, it was actually like a big punch in the gut for me. It's like, mm. we're already building this amazing thing and we lost our best researcher. And that's one of the things that also drew me to Facebook too. And I found that this research team, like Facebook were able to build, like I've seen many research teams. We were able to build one of the best research teams I've ever been able to see from various, we had a professor from Stanford, we had Dahlia Markey, one of the prominent computer scientists on, um, on distributed systems in the world, in the world, right? And we acquired amazing technology from you know, people like George Denises. I was able to see that he was able to curate a great team of excellent people, but they weren't always given the will to drive forward the innovation. And that was a gap. So I think there's a chip on the shoulder there, but I think certainly... Why is that the case? This gap that you just talked about, right? It's so common in the corporate world, right? You have these people who are extremely capable, but some, some for some reason... It's basically called corporate politics, right? Gonna say That's that. it, right? Yeah. So Evan doesn't do politics. I think mm -hmm. that's probably one gap, right? He just wants to build good product. He doesn't want to do all this kissing up and whatever. Yeah. He wants to be left alone to build the best product. Because the moment you're in politics, right? You are thinking about yourself, not yeah. about the greater good or the greater kind of success of the company. You're thinking about how do I get to this position? How Absolutely. do I get to this, right? Absolutely. Which is completely counterproductive, but is happening in every organization of a certain size. And we argue even like much smaller companies are full of politics. But also it's a, it's a sink, it's a time sink, right? Like it, you can't make the best use of your time for the things that really matter, and namely building a better product for your customers, solving real cha cha um, challenging problems. Right, like, which is why in our company we don't really tolerate it, right? Whether you're like, whether you're, uh, you know, an executive all the way to an engineer, like, we're not interested in that politics. We're very, we, we care about rewarding people based on their contributions, right? Like, if you contribute, you'll be rewarded. Like, we just care about results. Mm. So it's very metrocratic in that regard, right? Like, we don't like, we, we didn't want to build another Facebook from my perspective. And we understand why Facebook had to be like that and other companies mm. had to be mm. like that. But people like us don't really work well in that environment. Um, 
And in that regard, we don't think we want to build that kind of environment um, all over again as well. So you moved to Facebook, right? And then you were part of a team that was working on something called Libra. What was Libra? Libra was a very, very ambitious project where Facebook put together a consortium that built a blockchain. And this blockchain was going to be run by 20 plus organizations. We we're going to be founded by 20 plus organizations with a view of decentralizing in the future. And why were we doing that? We thought there was a big opportunity to make sending money around the internet as easy as sending an email. Facebook had done a great job in creating messaging product, um, products like You know, you can argue they acquired WhatsApp. You can't argue it is a fact they acquired WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Built Messenger, built Facebook mm -hmm. app. Um, that the idea of sending messages for free and engaging that um, in that sense was already something they'd done a really good job at. And we thought a world where sending money was frictionless was only a public good. It was actually a good for the world. Mm -hmm. And definitely born to that mission. I think it made, made a ton of sense. Um, if you had to ask me, like, was that the right way to go about it? I think it's one thing to build infrastructure. It's another thing to have a basket of currencies where, you know, if you have a distribution platform like Facebook with 2 billion users, right? Mm. And you give, you give any sense of it or any air of sense that, you know, you're going to unilaterally make a decision on who is in that basket. Although that wasn't the case, right? Like, but it doesn't matter. People thought, People right? thought Even about me, that. I remember I was like, I don't trust Facebook. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't trust yeah. them. Like, it's a, it's a monopoly, right? They're yes. just there already. Like, how how can they do that? Like, yeah. I mean, there's Bitcoin. The problem of Bitcoin is, because that's what it was, like, peer-to-peer -peer cash initially, right? Yeah. Uh, electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash, but too volatile. But then you have these stable coins, right? Tether, U USDC, and I mean, there was a lot of also talks about Tether, the backing, all that stuff. But then you're thinking... Would I trust more like kind of like a kind of crypto native company or yeah. like the kings of the world who already control everything? Would I trust them more about having good intentions for me? Yeah. Probably, probably not. not. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. I mean, that's, that's what Congress probably thought too, right? I mean, look, I really appreciate the fact that Mark Zuckerberg and David Marcus had the balls to actually try to do that, mm. right? It would not, I don't think you could have pulled this project off at Google. You couldn't have done it on Amazon. No other company would have had that entrepreneurial spirit to actually take on something so important. Um, but I think we should have probably taken more of a step-by-step -step approach. Just start with the blockchain and then build from there. Or just use an existing stable coin to show that we're supporting the US. Like, interestingly, like, if you think about it, blockchain's a great distribution network for the dollar. Right? It's a great dollarization tool. It's not something to be fought against, something to be welcomed by Congress. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Like it's making the US dollar even more powerful. If like, I was a content distribu like, like it's a content distribution network amazing. for money, yeah. DRM for money. Like, why would you not embrace that? I think it's just the messenger will got killed, right? Like it's, you know, yeah. kill the messenger to a large extent. Um, yeah. Why did the Facebook Libra project not work? I think because the, per the company who had founded the project, namely Facebook, was, I mean, what they had done in the past from losing public trust when it came to um, public data, it was used as leverage as a way to say they're not trustworthy to start a new system. And I, and I understand that. I definitely understand that. Um, no matter what we did to make it as, you know, democratic as possible, bringing multiple parties in, we cannot shake that idea that Facebook was central to the foundation of this project. You know. So that's one of the things, but is it the real reason that a government or the Congress would say, you can't do that, guys? Look, if you think about it, if you wake up tomorrow morning and 2 billion people have a bank account, the bank of Facebook, it's bigger than every country in the world, GDP-wise. It's the biggest bank ever. That's scary. So I think for any nation state, that's a problem. That's like... It's the unknown of what could happen, what the, you know, the second and third order effects of that could happen. I think mean, people didn't want to find out. The reality is <laughs> Facebook could have just set this thing up overnight and ask for goodness after. The problem is the overnight thing, right? Because yeah. if you think about it, Bitcoin, probably 2 billion people will own Bitcoin at some point, hopefully, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's happening. It takes so much time that so you have time. time to evolve and, yeah. and to understand. Whereas this thing is like... Overnight. <laughs> Literally overnight, like Facebook can fund everyone with a with a dollar bank account overnight. You have two billion people with a bank with a bank account. Like they have a big bank balance to do that, right? So I think I actually thought it would have been a great project 
to to start off. I I just think the history um, was a problem. Um, I do think right the the mission of sticking it to the banks or providing more accessible financial services to the world is a no. It, it's it's a noble one. It needs to be done, and I think an organization that has resources to do that, private sector organization, is trying to do that. Obviously, they'll benefit from it financially in the future. I think it's a great idea, but unfortunately, the history is a problem. What do you think would have been the right way to do it? Who should have done it and how should uh, they have done it? Well, think about it. Other people are doing it now, right? Without the same problems that Facebook has. Right? PayPal just launched PYUSD. Mm. All good, right? But it's much smaller. It's not like it's, an overnight thing. It's a smaller company. Thing. It's not like an overnight thing, yeah. right? And it's a US dollar directly. So I think if Facebook had probably gone with the mindset of just like, hey, we just launched US dollar, a tokenized US dollar on a blockchain, it will be available on, on Facebook app and it will be available anywhere else, perhaps would have had less of, a, um, of the same kind of worry. But at, at the same time, I think the, the basket of stablecoin issue became the index, it became what people really honed in on over and over again. Um, to the end where we took it away and just said, hey, we'll launch with a stable USD, but still. Even it's, after that, it's still too late. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know. But look, I, I believe in a world where Facebook in the future will onboard a stable coin. Mm. I think that's going to mm. happen. Like they'll have to because the rails, if you think about SWE right now, SWE does transactions faster than any other chain. It's the cheapest than any other chain and the transactions are instant. It's faster than when you type a Visa card <laughs> and pay. Mm. So blockchain is now at the stage where it can reach mainstream. After a while, like your fees you pay to pro processors are going to be too high comparative to a ledger that does it instantaneously at a low cost. So they're only going to have to pivot to the technology that makes sense. So I do see a future where Facebook will adopt the mm. technology because it's going to allow them to compete with other payment rails to a large extent. I think right now they'll probably have to stay back given the still the history and the stench of Libra. The government and the Congress kind of being able to shut down the Libra project, what does it actually say about the power that the governments have over the big technology companies and by extension over our data? It says a lot, right? It says a lot that they can effectively meddle in private enterprise at will, all with the disguise or the guise of like pub, um, public good, right? Or public interest. Because if you think about it, some of the questions that are being asked in public, I was, my jaw just fell like, wait, so how does Facebook make money? I'm like, are we asking that question? Isn't it clear? <laughs> like, it's always been clear how they made money. So I, I felt like there's a lot of grandstanding mm. uh, and it's less about the issues and more how to grandstand in front of the of, of the people. Um I do, I do think it, it, it is concerning, but I also, see, I see both sides. I, I, I do think, look, there is, a, there is a need to fight for the needs of the people. There is a need to ensure that, you know, monopolies do not um, dominate because then we have no choice and it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. I do think, I do believe in that. Um, but also, I, I also at the same time think, you know, single entities having power over your data and being able to set the rules ad nauseum is, is unfair. So I, I think, you know. And, and we just went one, I mean, 10 steps further in this direction with uh, the arrest of uh, the Telegram that co founder is, that is a couple of days ago. Yeah. Like, so you're seeing, it's not just, hey guys, <laughs> you're too big, you can't do that. You're uh, Facebook, right? It's, yeah. hey, if you don't comply with us, we'll come after you. We'll come after you and we'll throw you to jail, right? Which yeah. is completely crazy, right? Yeah. But a huge argument for, Decentralization, actually. I think the, the, the things we're building is only going to make it easier for people to build applications that are fair mm. for consumers. Mm. Like we, we just announced Walrus, which is a decentralized storage layer. You can run your application fully decentralized now, right? So if you want to not be drawn to the demands of a centralized party, let's say you get a, email, you get a call from Congress about why don't you turn your machines off <laughs> for this user, right? You almost think about that happened to TikTok to a large extent. Yeah. Right? Like that's in our partner with a US company, right? So I think democratic infrastructure is the way to go. Essentially, essentially started with TikTok, now it's Telegram. Yeah. And then there's not many left. It will go over and battle, over again. Right? Yeah. So like the kind of time is limited to decentralize everything. 
if you think about it, you talk about demo democracy, right? The democratic system. I know you're a big fan of Switzerland, where I'm from. Shout out to Switzerland. Sweet. <laughs> But not <laughs> sweet, Switzerland. <laughs> Sweet Switzerland and sweet Switzerland. <laughs> um, but not for the reason that most people mention, right? Yeah. The nature, the calm, the fresh air is great, yeah. but it's not the reason why you love Switzerland. Can you explain why you love Switzerland so much that you include it in the Misten Labs and Sui network pitch? Yeah, I, I love Switzerland because I think if you think about it, it's, it's a, it is a neutral platform. Right, it's a neutral area for us to deal, to do business with one another, and Switzerland's always been very neutral in that regard, and we think that that ideology really resonates well with the concept of decentralization. Mm. Right, the reason why I'm very bearish on enterprise blockchain, I was one person involved heavily in in um, enterprise blockchain for quite a while, and I came out of it realizing that ultimately, you know, someone decide somebody the bootstrapping issue first. Then people want to make up the rules, right? I want to have a piece of ownership. I want to decide my rules, right? I want to decide who participates. It, you, you, you're shut down before you can even start. And it's no wonder why we're not seeing much success with, with um, centralized or enterprise blockchain that I still think is going to be problematic. And you're starting to, I'm actually starting to see more and more conversations on how do we use public infrastructure in a way that still allows us to comply. And what that means is there's no more argument around who owns the infrastructure. Right? Who sets the rules for the infrastructure? The rules are clear for everyone to accept. You either participate or you don't. Choose another network, right? I think having that very neutral layer where the rules are set, the, it's, it's clear how you engage and clear how you don't engage, is only going to be beneficial. And I think the kind of infrastructure we're building, like we've said, there are multiple things you have to decentralize from the internet to make better. You have to decentralize the coordination of assets, which is sweet how I exchange one value for another. You have to decentralize the storage mm -hmm. as well because how do I store, where do I store my files? And how do I make sure that is also not um, held by single entities over time as well? That's Boris, which we've built. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be how do we decentralize the networking layer as well? Because that's another way that could shut you down. Oh, we're not going to route your traffic through here. Or maybe we'll force you, we'll ignore your connections. We'll go through here instead. So we're going to do all that. We've started with the coordination layer. We decentralize that. We're, we're now doing the storage layer. We're decentralizing that. We then go to the networking layer. We decentralize that mm. also. And we'll add other mechanisms. You need a multi-layer approach. And I think, which is why I always say, like, look, it's, I love it. It's fun. People are focused on building blockchains. I think the target addressable market of that is small compared to what we're trying to do. Mm. Like, I'm thinking about the internet as a whole. Mm. I want to compete with Google, Amazon, um, Alibaba. I want to build a layer of the internet that allows everybody to build commerce from that regard. And I think Switzerland is the right kind of mechanism. It's just fortuitous, I would call it SWE. And people always, whenever Switzerland's playing, people would say, hey, hey, SWE winning <laughs> today. <laughs> Why is the Swiss system not replicated in many other countries if it's so fair and beneficial for its citizens? I don't know enough of the history to be able to give a good opinion there. So I have to be, I have to admit that, but I, I, I think there's, there's also a need of, there's also like a hunger for power, right? And I think the Swiss system, to a large extent, almost extends power to the people, mm. right? Which is what a blockchain does, mm. which is what decentralized infrastructure does. Whereas I feel other democratic systems tend to want to concentrate power within the government rather than something that's really, it's given with the guise of to the people, but it's not really, right? Um, That's my uneducated answer off the top of my head. Um, I, I think it's more of a question of like, who do you prioritize? What do you prioritize? We prioritize the people, so we build a system that's beneficial to the people. And um, yeah, I mean, others will come with other arguments, but I, this is my, my argument. What is Bitcoin and crypto to you? Bitcoin for me is an embodiment of um, a financial system that the people deserve, but they don't have. Um, Can I, you explain that if you were talking to your mother? Yeah. So I say, mom, today you put 20 pounds in the bank. If things go, if the bank make bad decisions, that 20 pounds of yours may not be yours. Mm. It might belong to the bank. We've actually had banks do bail-ins. Forget about bail-outs, mm. bail-ins, where certain amounts of funds 
over X amount of dollars, right, or whatever denom denomination it is, the bank will put that as part of its own pool of funds to protect the bank's assets. So your money that you give to the bank is actually not yours. Beyond that, the on an annual basis, the government has freedom to dilute your ownership of your, the, the amount of value you have. So you've worked for a year. First, you pay taxes, which is one thing, because you're contributing to the upkeep of the, um, of the country. But then they'll dilute the amount of money you've earned over the, over the last one of a year because of debts and everything else. So the amount of money you have is not what you think. Bitcoin is the embodiment of what the people deserve because it has no inflation. There is no way by which to dilute the money you have. What you have is what you have. Separately, it's visible. So you could always see what you own. You could prove what you own at any given time. It's, 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 it's decentralized, which means there's no single body that can take ownership of your asset or make rules around your asset. So I think it's also Switzerland in the sense that the rules are clear of how you engage. Mm -hmm. So I think it is where the financial system, re where we really need to think about a gold standard. It's what we want. It's better than gold, in my view, because you could always make more gold. You can't make more Bitcoin. Um, but I'm not a bear on gold. I actually love gold. Um, but I think it's, I feel it's the future of what we need for the financial system. I think it's a terrible currency. <laughs> it's a great commodity. Um, it's a great way to, it's a great store of value. Absolutely proven store of value, the best store of value that we've had in the last 10, 10 years. What's the biggest problem that we're facing today in our industry? In crypto as a whole, um, my view is the last eight years have been a repeated film that has not changed. Which is? Basically, magic internet money, no value add, just keep getting more retail in and, you know, find a way to extract value. A great casino. <laughs> It's a great casino, right? Like, <laughs> I absolutely... Crypto I, is a great casino. That's absolutely. True. I, you know, I, I do... Look, there's an element of gambling to everything that we do, right? Like, you buy stocks, you... Like people say you're yeah. investing, right? Like, look, you put 10,000 in JP Morgan, you're not investing. You're making a punt, right? It's a bet. Yeah, it's a bet, right? yeah. absolutely. JP Morgan don't see your money, right? Like it's, it's a bet. Your money on the future, absolutely. Yeah, so I think an investment in crypto infrastructure is a bet that you make in a public company. It's very, it's very similar in that regard. But I think unfortunately that what we've failed to see is like breakouts to the mass um, consumer. Like we want to see, like I always say DeFi is great, but DeFi is great for only those who have assets. Mm. Right, we touched about we want to build infrastructure that everybody can gain value from. But if I have no assets, I have no way to play. Um, but I also, I, I'm also um, positive in the sense that it takes time. Mm. Right, it takes time to realize its value, and, I, and I'm hoping in this next cycle, with some of the work we're doing and some of the work other chains are doing, we'll start to see those breakout applications. Like I want to see a world where you know, hundreds of millions of real users are using crypto, but don't know they're using crypto, but they're using it because it's a better rail. Right, and they're not being shilled a coin. They're being basically in, welcome into a new in, uh, ecosystem that gives them value that they can't extract from a traditional rails. So I think that's the world I want to see. And I think, unfortunately, we've been playing the same games over and over again in crypto for a while. Why do you think that's the case? I think lack of really good product builders. I'm just going to be honest, right? Like, it, it, like if I look at the amount of talent that's gone to crypto. Which is why when we're at Facebook, we're looking, wait, these guys keep building, like they keep building the same stuff. They're not really innovating. The products are really just rehash of each other. Everyone's trying to make, like if you think about the games that came out in crypto first as well, they end up being casinos. <laughs> they're just like spreadsheets turned into games. They weren't real games. They weren't mm. really fun. Mm. And we thought, well, people are missing the big impact here. Like we saw like, if you can build this Swiss army knife of the infrastructure that everybody can play on, you can really disrupt a lot of businesses. Mm. And I think the product builders did had, had not entered. If you look at the quality of builders in the last two, three years, I say the skill level has gone up significantly. Our team alone, we have a ton of PhDs, some of the best researchers in the world. There's no way, right, like you'd have seen that in crypto five years ago. Impossible, right? We have some of the best consensus researchers, best cryptographers in the market, in our company as a result. Great product builders who are building amazing experiences now that you wouldn't have seen before. And even looking at things like you, right, like great product, product builders are now coming into the space. And I think that skill set is starting to increase. And I think over time, we'll start to reach, we'll start to see the applications that are going to reach the mass market, in my view. 
So I think, yeah, it's a lack of skillful builders, um, lack of high quality. And I think we'll start to see the reward of that um, over the next coming years. So you said we need to build a Swiss army knife of infrastructure. What is Misten Labs? So Misten Labs is effectively a lab. We call ourselves a, a lab. But our goal is to build um, platforms and protocols to make the internet more decentralized. So we will birth public infrastructure and give it to the community and help grow adoption of that infrastructure because we think it'll make the internet a better place. That's the mission of a company. And that's what we sell to employees over and over again. Like we're, you're here because you're building a better version of the internet. Um, we'll start with SWE. It's going to be the best layer one possible. We'll then go to Walrus. It'll be the best storage layer possible. We we'll decentralize the networking stack and we we'll decentralize other things as well. So that's what Mr. Labs is. It's a team of highly, probably, I, I would always argue, like we have probably the greatest density of, um, of, of talent in the crypto space within the, within the lab itself. Um, if you look at the citations of our, of our researchers, the, sh the amount of things we've shipped in the space of 12 months since mainnet, we've upgraded our consensus um, after a year of mainnet. I mean, people struggle to ship one protocol upgrade in like three, four years, right? I think ETH is still trying to upgrade to whatever version it is. I think Fidance is a couple of years away. Who knows, right? Like, we're already there. Like, we already, we already have something that does 100,000 transactions per second. We already now have to scale infinitely by adding more, more nodes, right? So the, the, the craft and the expertise of coming from a big company like Facebook and building things that billions of people use day in, day out, that has not come to the space. And I think Misten uniquely brings that mm. to the space. You mentioned Sui Network, your first like project, basically. What is Sui Network if you had to explain it to your mother? <sighs> I had to explain to my mother. <laughs> okay, so I'd say the internet is great for moving information. It was built to move information. Do you see how you send your email? Great at doing that. You see how you do a video call? Great at doing that. But now I want to send money. I want to send you money. We have very complicated things that exist today that allow you to send money from person A to person B. And because of a complicated nature, it ends up being quite expensive to use, right? It gets owned by single organizations who want to charge as much as possible or extract as much value out of it from you, from your perspective. So I would say um, SWE comes into the place to reduce your cost, gives a very simple piece of infrastructure to reduce the cost for you to send money or send value across the internet as simple as possible. It is what the internet needs to make sending money easier across the board. So that's, that's always been our thing. Like we, our goal with SWE, like these are the requirements. If I, I would say from a product perspective, what is your requirement? We want developers to be able to build and they should be able to understand how to build um, compelling applications within three to four days. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Within three to four days, you should be able to build compelling applications. Second, you should not be a smart contract expert to be able to build on SWE. That's the second thing. Third, you should not have to worry about scale of infrastructure, right? When you go to build on Amazon or you go to build on GCP today, your worry is not, would Google be able to meet the demand of my application? Mm. It's, can I make enough money for my business to keep lights on, right? Infrastructure and crypto today doesn't offer you that. For one, if you get successful, fees go up which means you can't scale, mm. right? The more transactions, the higher the fees. Congestion, transactions fail. All these things that you shouldn't see in traditional Web 2 exist in Web 3. Um, SWE doesn't have any of that. So SWE, we're learning now that devs, within hours all the way to two to three days, they're picking up SWE really, really quickly, mm. right? We're talking about Web 2 and Web 3 devs, people who have experience in writing. In fact, I think um, Ruta from Solend, which is... Uh, a Solana protocol mm. built um, Sui Lend on Sui. They they said it's a 10x improvement in development from Solana, from our experience. Um, so we've we've nailed the developer experience with Sui, and now we've also nailed the performance. So transactions finalize on Sui within end to end within 600 milliseconds, which means it's fast on the website. You click before the website is reloaded, you've already your transactions gone through. So you can build compelling user experiences on SWE and you can build it and not worrying about fees going through the roof because a blockchain can add more capacity as needed. So gas fees don't spike in SWE. 
at all. Hopefully that helps. You, your mom is a, is a solid mom. <laughs> your mom's brain. I took I mean, a, I took a bit brain, beyond my mom. So. <laughs> I took a bit beyond my mom there. Yeah. Yeah, my mom struggled with, e with emails. So I think that's a, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a different story altogether. <laughs> you told me crypto hasn't delivered for too long, right? How is Sui Network solving this issue? So I'll say, look, what has delivered so far is Bitcoin showed us that you can have a very solid um, store of value. So it succeeded to a large degree. And mm. anyone that argues it, I don't know what history, mm. if economics have read, it's done a really great job in showing it's a great store of value. No matter how much people like to dump on it, it's done a great job. It's slow, fine. I think that's a feature, not a bug. It's mm. meant to be the way it is. I don't think Bitcoin's ever going to change. I'm okay with that. Ethereum t thought, um, taught us effectively that you can have programmable money. Mm. They can start to build rules around money. Um, from Sweet perspective, we show that you can coordinate any um, kind of intent on the internet. So that's really where we want to deliver. I think Ethereum was great as, if you think about it, right, it's a more advanced form of a spreadsheet, but it just really just holds balances and allows you to do very basic things. It's not great at really allowing you to build complex rules around assets. And mm. I think that's why you have all these crazy standards and ease. You have so many hacks because the platform was not built for what it was designed for. And it's very hard for smart contracts. And I actually think developers in, in eSpace are very, very good devs. So it's not like they want to write things with bugs. They're doing their best to actually build safe code. And they have auditors and everything else. Still, you have hacks. Because it's very, very hard to build on a platform that is inherently unsafe. Right? Which is why at Libra, we could not use ETH. Mm. Like, there was no way. Like, we already had enough regulatory issues to deal with, but then to now convince them that we can build the world's monetary system on inherently unsafe language, it's just not gonna, it wasn't going to fly. So we had to build a much more safer programming and paradigm for people to work with. So crypto is largely on the, like you can't, you can't build a business if every couple of years, every couple of months, right, you see a 20 million, 100 million dollar hack, right? It's going to keep setting you back. So I think crypto is largely undelivered because the developer platforms are not, are not expressive enough for developers to build really complaining applications. One, they're too slow, they're too expensive, it takes too long to learn, right? Um, the, the, it's, it encourages you to build in really bad tokenomics, ultimately because if you're successful, prices, the, um, the demand, sorry, if you're successful, the gas fees go through the roof because it has to deal with congestion one way or the other. So it's not the right environment to build real businesses. I think that's one of the things that crypto largely wants to deliver on, but technology wise, technology wise, it's not been possible. Ask the following question to Keone from Monad. So I'm gonna ask you the same. Yeah. Do we really need another layer one? Yes. Why? So I would say, do we need yet another ETH L2? <laughs> right? So, so you will answer yes to. <laughs> I would say, look, I think the only place that L2 should exist is in the ETH space. Mm. I'm going to be very clear on that. Um, ETH has built a lot of value. It has a lot of value that's built over time. And, you know, people want to do things faster, right? And you can argue that ETH needs better L2s to allow that to happen. Unfortunately, none of the L2s actually work. They're too expensive. They're not, that, they're not that flexible. They make a lot of compromises and largely they haven't delivered on a mission, right? Now, I believe L1s have no excuse. If you're building a new L1, you have no excuse. You should absolutely build a scalable L1. Don't force multiple layers of abstractions for people. Build something that's scalable from day one. And my argument is all L1s today are highly unscalable. Do not have great developer experience discourage success, right? And ultimately have not proven to be um, as robust as infrastructure demands. For example, Sui is the only chain that's never had downtime. We've never had a single day of downtime since the network's been live. We've never had fee spike through the roof. The network has always never had congestion because the network can handle. We, had, we did more transactions today than any blockchain in history when games were running. Nobody noticed, it was so boring. Nobody noticed because the network could handle the scale. So I would say all blockchains bar three have that problem. It sounds crazy, but that's just a fact, right? We don't have 
report of transactions failing, you have to restart all over and over again. It doesn't happen because that's how the internet should work. It's how highly scalable infrastructure should work. And you cannot argue that you're a scalable infrastructure if you have outages, right? The whole point of being scalable is to be able to deal with, it is always to have uptime. You can say I could do a billion transactions per second, but if you're out every couple of days, right? Like you're not usable, especially if you want to have high, highly resilient uh, applications. So yeah, that's my, that's my view. I think we do need another L1 because I think most L1s are failed to deliver on enabling developers to really experiment with what's, what's possible. And I think some of the things we've built in SWE, the fact that devs can build within two hours and be really, really start to understand the primitives. And if you're a normal object-oriented programming language developer, you can pick up SWE very quickly because it's the same concepts. But also you don't have to know what happens under the hood of SWE. Like it's just easy to, to build on. Um, What is the second project that you're building? What is Walrus Protocol? Okay. So now we feel we've, we've meet, met our mission and solving the coordination problem for the internet. We think SWE will be the most interesting or the most important coordination layer for assets. The next thing we need to coordinate is data, right? Right now, Web3 is a bit of a joke because you have an NFT, you mint the NFT. Where is the file for the NFT? It's on Azure. It is on AWS. It might be on IPFS that can't guarantee that a file will be there, right? Mm -hmm. It might be on other forms of storage that you can't read it back readily as fast as possible. It might have super weird tokenomics that discourage you from storing a lot of files. Mm -hmm. It might encourage you to pay 100 years in advance for your storage, as in Arweave, for example, which is not economical. So um, what we've built is a, is a business default tolerant storage layer for um, for the masses. So if you want to run your application fully decentralized, if you want to store video content, if you want to store terabytes, petabytes of data, you can now do that on a blockchain for the first time. And it does it with economics that is very, that people are used to. You can pay for storage as you go. You can pay for storage well in advance. You could trade your storage in. If you don't need a storage anymore, you can sell it in open marketplace. It's what I feel is a decentralized AWS or GCP. And a great thing about Warus is it also supports traditional um, technologies like um, load balancers. If you want to put, you know, cash layers on top of it, you could do that as well. So you can build fully immersive web experiences on Warus using Warus sites today. And that, I think, is going to elevate the building experience. So now every app in Web3 can have a layer where the entire app is built on mm. rather than having a decentralized Back end, you can have a decentralized front end as well. There are security benefits as well to this because now the app is built on a public layer. You can know that you're, the app you're interacting with is not malicious. You can know it's what the developer is intended to do. We have some ba binary transparency as well that makes it possible for you to know, for the wallet to know that it's engaging with a real application. So these elements of where you have DNS hacks and whatever will not be possible anymore. So, you know, even worlds where sites get hi hijacked, now all you have to do is try hijack the private key. Well, we know key management is an easy problem to solve than paying a lot of money to have security teams run all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, monitoring to ensure that your site is always up, right? So I think it's going to simplify the security story for, for devs in Web3. It's also going to give them the ability to have fully decentralized applications for the first time, which I think is key to the mission of, uh, of Web3 as a whole. So you guys managed to do something pretty big. You got Raul Pal as a board member of the SWE Foundation, right? Raul, who is also a, who was also on this podcast. Why did it make sense to have Raul as an advisor? So it's interesting because... Um, Raul is someone I've actually listened to for quite a while. Mm. Um, I love um, his, his his Twitter account. I love his um, his videos on YouTube. I've always watched them even before even before we started missing actually. Um, and interestingly, we wanted people who would come with a broader world worldview than just crypto as a whole. 
if you think about like what you want your board to be, like it can't always be yes people. It's going to be people who might be contrarian. So at, at the beginning, it wasn't like Raul was like, oh, gung-ho, I love Sui, whatever. He had to learn what we're trying to build. Why is it differentiated? Okay, I'm going to advise you guys and give you some great ideas on on how you could think about um, um, growing the network and how you could think about, you know, ensuring that you're trying to meet the mission that you set out to do. And over time, I think it's becoming a lot clearer to him how truly differentiated the technology is. Mm. I always make the point that no one looks at a sweet tech and doesn't love it. Like, I, I kid you not. If if anybody looks under the underpinnings of SWE, you read the papers, you play around with the dev, um, dev experience, nobody walks away thinks this is terrible. No one walks away thinking this isn't innovative. I think it's tech that starts to make sense. And the things we've done, when we read it over to people, it's so obvious. It's so obvious, right? Um, so people start to fall in love with the tech and we're a very tech-driven team. People say we stuck at marketing at the beginning. Largely right, because what we focused on was Let's like we were obsessive. Let's build the best developer experience possible, and Raul could see that we're passionate about the dev experience. It had to be the best. Like we're not interested in building just a two x experience. It needs to be ten x, hundred x better than building anywhere else. And it needed to scale. And I think that mission really resonates with him. And he could see that now from an app experience. You just take one app in Sui and play with it, and play with another app on ETH or Stall or whatever. Mm-hmm. The end to end responsiveness is something you can't argue about. It's there. Was the kind of value added that most people would not think of that a person like Raul can bring to a project as an advisor? Um, I think he comes with a so he has a very good long term view. He, he's a great economist as a whole, right? So when a, when you have like market cycles like ours in crypto that's volatile as hell, he's been through it, mm. right? He could tell you, calm down, like it's nothing. <laughs> We've been through this before, right? So it, it's great from that regard to have some, someone who's crypto native also been through the wars and can see what has happened before. I think I've been in crypto since 2012. I've seen all sorts of cycles, but the whole company isn't crypto native, right? People in the company come from Facebook, come from Google, come from all these other companies where you don't have like crazy volatility in, in your emotions on a day-to-day basis, right? So I think having someone in a room that has been through that is being super helpful as a whole. And he's got a great strategic mind as well, right? On, you know, helping us make the right decisions when it comes to, you know, prioritizing what we do um, with the founda- the foundation. You're fascinated by the space and space exploration. Why is space exploration so important for the advancement of humanity? First of all, Star Trek, not Star Wars. People are going to hate me. They're going to write me off right away. But I just grew up with Star Trek. I was always like a geek for anything space related. I think the idea of like, captain of a starship, flying out to all sorts of unknowns and discovering strange new worlds. The adventurous part is something that really, really caught my eye, um, which is one of the reasons why I also wanted to do astrophysics, right? Like, mm. couldn't be further from what we're trying to actually do here today. But I was always fascinated by physics and space as a whole. Technically, we're all trying to go to the moon, so... <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all trying to, we're still trying to so, go to the moon. So. <laughs> you know, crypto but... Is a, crypto is a... It, it, crypto it, is another it, it, thing, you know. <laughs> It's another. It's another thing. We'll, we'll go to the moon, but I, I, I love the idea of space from that regard. Right? It's it's the uncharted, the undiscovered, and just new things that can be discovered. Right? So I totally understand Elon's idea about space, like why he's trying to go there. Like it's this uncharted territory. But another thing is like we're not going to the bottom of the ocean as well. Like things to be charted on our own planet as, as it is. Right? So you know. But I will always be drawn to it. Maybe one day I can afford to fly my, to fly to, to do the, what do you call it? Is that Richard Branson's? Uh, um, Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic. Maybe one yeah. day. Uh, I think the ticket is 250K now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll wait for many just people wait for to one go Bitcoin first. <laughs> just, just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I, I want, I want more people to guinea pig it first. <laughs> before I, before I go. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll be all on that. Cal- calculated risk taking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I think my wife would be a, a no. She hates skydiving as a whole, so. Have you ever done skydiving? I've never, every time I've signed up for it, something happens. I remember I signed up in Miami and the clouds were too low. And sometimes too windy. Like there's always something, but it's something I've always wanted to do. Have you ever done bungee jumping? No, I've not done that. That I don't want to do. Interestingly, I prefer skydiving to bungee jumping. I don't think it's interesting. I'm the same. I th- I, I, for some reason, I feel like one is much less risky than the other. I think one skydiving be- is way less risky than a bungee jumping. Yeah, I think yeah. too. Yeah. So <laughs> the idea that it's a rope that, 
they have to calculate precisely so that my head doesn't go bouncing off the concrete or the water versus I'll trust the, something I see people do all the time, namely a parachute. I think that sounds more interesting to me, but also it's longer. Like I think there's a, you know, you get to enjoy it a bit more. And, and probably because really, you're so high, you don't kind of feel the risk, right? Because you're kind of like really far away. Far away. There's this kind of theory. It's kind of like a physics theory, theory like infinite, infinitely small and infinitely big. Yes. They kind of join, right? Yes. And so I think it's probably linked to that. Yeah. The two type, the multiple types of infinity that people have to learn, right? <laughs> Talking about infinity. The space is by definition infinite, infinite. I'm not yeah. sure how would we say that in English. What does that mean? The space is infinite because it kind of sounds like, if you really think about it, it's really hard to comprehend. We're talking about space, a space or spaces in crypto? Space. Space, yeah. space. It, infinity is actually a hard thing for people to comprehend. Like I find myself, um, I find myself also thinking the same thing. Like, for example, there are different levels to infinity, right? There's a different infinity for the size of the universe versus the amount of stars that exist, right? There's a different infinity for how many grains in the sand uh, are, on, are on the seashore versus, you know, how many air particles that we have in our... It, when things... There are different degrees of infinity, I'd like, to, I'd like to argue. I think the infinity of space is scary as hell. Like, it is very, very scary to think that you can go into the depths forever and ever and ever. And even let's say you reach the edge of the expanse, right? I mean, people think there's still things beyond that expanse. What's, out, what's outside, what's of outside the expanse? expanse? That's yeah, scary logic. as well, right? You know, like who knows? Like what do we meet at the, at the end of the expanse? Do we burn up or, or do you meet a supreme being at the end of the expanse, right? Who knows? Like these are, these are amazing things, but I don't think we ever find out. I actually think there's some things we'll never find out in our timeline. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't venture out to figure it out, to be, to be honest. I think this is why, like, it's a space that you'd, you'd research forever and ever and only learn incremental new things over time. Um, yeah. What would you answer to the people who say, complain, hey, like, we're spending too much money on exploring all this stuff when we have much more pressing issues to solve on Earth? I'm sympathetic to, I'm sympathetic to those. For sure. I mean, if you think about it, right, like a lot of our tax money goes to space exploration. It's funded by the public. The public should have a voice with how their funds are spent, right? Like they should have a say in how if you're a democratic system, right? Um, you could argue that we've, we've had a lot of scientific advancement from space exploration and the ROI is high. It would be good to have a public, like, a public view on what those are, what that ROI is, so people can make an informed opinion, right? Rather than just making it this, you know, this thing that people don't have a view on, people don't have a say in, in my view. Like, give people information and data with which to make a decision, rather than hiding it and shielding it in obscurity. So, I actually think people, I, I trust the public in that regard. If you can show, hey, look, we're able to cure this X, Y, and Z disease because we spent twenty billion in space exploration then maybe people might be more sympathetic because it ties to things that matter to mm. them rather than random scientific discoveries that they might not be able to correlate with the real world. Uh, so. I mean, one such argument could be that the technology used to fuel a spacecraft, right, can be used to, to build planes that are much faster and to go like, let's say, I mean, I came from Singapore here, right? Yeah. If you do it... I think direct flight is probably 15, 16, 17 hours. Yeah. You, can, you could probably do it in the future in one or two hours, right? Yeah. Thank to, thanks to space exploration. Yeah. So. I don't I like mean, that argument because <laughs> we had Concorde before, right? And then we shut that down. But also, I mean, look, it's, this is public enterprise. If a mm. public company or private, sorry, if, if, if a private enterprise can see an ROI in doing it, they should fund it and take the space technology mm. and build the faster plane. Um, I think a world where we think government should go and spend that money and figure that out, that probably doesn't make much sense. Um, you know? Probably that, never really works, right? No. Nah. We have the example with Elon, yeah. SpaceX, right? Yeah. Versus government, right? See how he's done it way better than the government Absolutely. could have, right? So <laughs> if someone is driven by profits, they might make better decisions in that, in that sense, right? So yeah, maybe Elon might build, Elon, build us a better, you know, better planes, 
faster planes. Yeah, but Elon has so many other things to do. He has many things to do. He's juggling many balls right <laughs> now. So yeah, he's got bigger problems. So another big topic that um, you're passionate about is God, right? Yeah. You told me you're a very spiritual person and a big believer in God. Yeah. What is God? To me, well, what is God? God, God for me is the supreme creator of everything that we see and that we are today. Um, like you see on my Twitter account, I say Jesus, family, crypto. I think that's the order. Yeah, Jesus, family, crypto. So it's, it's, I've, it's always been a very important part of my life. Um, I grew up in a Christian family, um, became a Christian at the age of 16, and always endeavored to follow the principles of the Bible ever since. Things like treat people like they, you want to be treated, these things make sense. Um, things like love your neighbor, makes sense, right? Try not to take revenge on people, makes sense, although it freaking hurts. You know, if someone is jibing you on Twitter, you want to go back and stick it onto them. I still have to work on that. But, you know, it's, I, I think there, these are great principles. But beyond that, I think I do believe that there is a supreme being in God, right? I do believe that um, he's made himself known multiple times through history. But I also believe that, you know, unfortunately, in the world we live in today, a lot of it has been, a lot of aspects of what God is and, you know, has been monetized by, you know, charlatans and whatever. And it's even been politicized as well, which I absolutely hate. But I think God for me is a, is a personal thing. It's something you have to have a personal relationship, a personal faith in. And that's what I have, is a personal faith, a personal relationship. I pray on a regular basis. I read the Bible on a regular basis. It's not something I try to throw on someone else's head, right? So, yeah. And I, I, and, I, and I hope that those principles are the way by which I treat our employees, I treat people around me, and, and over, over, over time as well. So, Why do you believe in God? Um... So I believe, so why do I believe in it? For one, um, I believe from the preponderance of evidence from my own study that Jesus was a being that actually existed 2,000 years ago. Mm. Um, from not just biblical sources, but external sources that Jesus existed. Beyond that, the history um, of the, the, the history that we have in Genesis all the way to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the, from what we have from Moses, Abraham, you name it, like, I, I think if I, from every book I've read, I find it very, very hard to imagine that, you know, one person or a group of humans can come together with such a great story. From the, from the, from the predictions that you have in the book of Daniel, all the way to the destruction of the, of the you know, the, the, the temples, from the prediction of the Messiah coming in the Old Testament. These are just, these are amazing, amazing stories. If you look like in the, in the book of Genesis and, and Exodus, every 50th word in the Genesis and Exodus, basically, um, it basically, in fact, if you look at um, Deuteronomy, every, every um, I can't remember if it's 49th word or something like that, every 49th word basically spells God's name. Every 49th word in Ex um, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy also read some um, um, similar word as well. So you got... You basically got numerology happening in the Bible. You also got predictions in the Bible in regards to what's going to be foretold in the future. It predicted the coming of the Roman Empire. It predicted the coming of the Greek Empire. It predicted the fall of the Roman Empire. It predicted the, the destruction of Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire. So, I mean, for me, those are enough. And from my relationship from praying and seeing things answered and from my experience, it's enough for me. Now, is that enough for everybody else? Probably not. This is why I think it's a personal walk, right? Um, it's a personal walk for each each and every every, every single person. Now, Val Rabikon said, everybody wants spirituality. No one wants the truth. See, the reason why I disagree with that is it's, it's, it's already making a supposition that spirituality isn't the truth, mm. right? Like, we already know that, you know, There's, there, there's more to this world, right? From like, there's more to this world than what we see, right? Like even elements of science will tell us that, that there's more to this world than the things that we see. Um, and I, I also think like, if you, if you think about as a software engineer, right, just thinking about DNA, the code of life and everything mm -hmm. else, right? Like you're trying to tell me 
that I have a programming language that writes itself, that has its own compiler, that has its own error correction, that replicates itself with almost 99.999 um, success rate is something that just happened by chance. Mm. These are the things that <laughs> I think that level of infinity for me is almost impossible mathematically. Again, it's good for, for me, it's acceptable, right? I, I think that's, those are the kind of things that are, I add as the evidence list. It's not the only thing, right? But I think for others, they love chance. And they think that, for me, like I, I follow people like James Tor, Professor James Tor, who is, for me, one of the most profound, um, um, uh, pr profound organic chemists in the world. And just the amount of research he's done over the years and the discoveries he's, he's made over the years. He's one of the most celebrated um, scientists in space. And he's a big believer. He's a big, he's a big believer in Jesus, right? Um, it's, I just feel like there's too much evidence of, 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 of a supreme being, mm -hmm. right? Some people might say it's aliens. Some people might say it's, who knows, right? It could be whatever you want, right? Um, but yeah, a, a being out of this world built everything. You could say it's an alien did it. For me, it's God, right? That, that they did, but whatever it is for you. Do you believe in destiny? What is the definition of destiny? Something is written. Your path is basically written. Everything happens for a reason. Um, My definition of destiny. <laughs> okay, so everything happens for a reason. I think everything has everything ha that you do has a cause, in, is what I would say, right? Like, there's a cause behind what you do. Nothing is truly, nothing is truly random. Mm. That there is always a cause to everything that happens, right? Everything in this world has a cause. The universe basically has a beginning, right? The Big Bang. Everything that happens that we've observed in life has a cause. The universe started, therefore it has a cause, right? And normally causation is something that's driven. It's something that happens because someone had to do something. So mm. I would say everyone has the ability to chart their own destinies, right? Decisions that you make will result in outcomes. So you could also say karma, right? Like karma. you get what you get. You put something in, you get something out, right? It comes back at you. Um, I think everything does absolutely have a cause, um, but I don't believe that um, there is this thing that written that you can't change it. I don't think that's possible in that regard. For you personally in your life, right? Like I think you have the ability to change your destiny by making the right decisions or making the wrong decisions. I had Ray Chan, the founder of Nine Gag and Mimland on this podcast, and he shared uh, with me the incredibly sad story of losing his young son He's yeah. very open about that. Yeah. We talked about it for like 10 or 15 minutes and went really deep into that. How do you explain this kind of tragic event in the context of spirituality and God? Really good question. So, unfortunately, we live in a world where... So, if I, if I, if I explain from, from a Christian point of view, right? So, I believe that God made a perfect world to start with. But in making a perfect world, he also wanted children who can make their own decisions. I think it's one thing to create people that are sheep, that have no decision-making ability whatsoever, right? I can make, let's say I make you a wife, and you know this wife is programmed to love you 100%, cannot deviate from you. Is that real love at that point? The person cannot make a decision. There's no free will. There's no choice there. So that's an imperfect being from my, from my perspective, and God is a being that can make his own decisions. So in his, in his view of making beings like himself, he gave us free choice to make a decision. He also told us what happens when we make good decisions and bad ones. Mm -hmm. We decided to make decisions that ultimately benefited us. And I think sin is something related to doing something opposite to what God's will is. And we live in a world that is full of opposition to God's original design. And as a result, we have many um, side effects as a result of decisions that were made thousands of years ago by, you know, people before us and over and over again, and we're paying for that now. It is, the argument would be, is that fair? I would say in God's view, like, honestly, like, I, it's, it's one of those things, right? Like, I, I've reached a position where I don't question God because I ultimately believe that he can see the beginning, the, the end and the beginning. So his wisdom completely supersedes mine. I'm willing to delegate my destiny or my thoughts of, of the future to him. I think... Unfortunately, in the world we live in, we live in a fallen state of the world where things happen as a result of, of sin. And unfortunately for him as well, right? He lost his son. 
I'm so not saying disease. So a disease of disease. your young son would come from a sin. No, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying disease, death. All these things were not things God wanted for us, right? Because remember Adam and Eve, on a day you make this decision, you shall surely die, mm. right? Mm. Death was not something that was designed for us. Disease was not something designed for us. He wanted good for us, right? But ultimately, we can make our own decisions. And as a result of our sin at the beginning, all these things came into the world, which mm. is why he sent us a savior at the end of the day will come and change the world and make it perfect again, right? So I think at that point, you'd have, if you imagine from day zero to day, to, day, um, to the end of the day, right? You'd have found people who had made a decision to follow him, who have made a decision to believe in him, or who have made a decision to live lives that um, have the principles that he he wants in life, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect answer, mm. but it's it's my response in in this very short, very quick question that you, you asked me. I I think it's it, suffering is is a reality that we have to deal with on a day to day basis. I was explaining that my mom. Um, eight years ago, eight years ago had a stroke and she's been bedridden ever since. And my mom is a avid believer, right? Strong believer, strong faith woman, right? Um, you know, and to see her in that scenario is very, very difficult for me as a, as a son. Mm. Um, but again, like my, my faith rests in the fact that there'll be a day when she would perfect it again. Right. This is this is a temporary state we're in in this world, and in the future, there'll be a perfected state for her where she's not going to be sick anymore. But again, I'm not going to be in a position where I lambast God. Go, why didn't you make it perfect? Right? Why didn't you fix it? You know. So. So even in that situation, that is a really bad one with your mother. Yeah. You're able to explain what happened with the help of God. Or is there like such a moment in your life where you said, I really can't explain why this happened? So if you, if you imagine when Jesus was in the world, um, I remember when the, the lady, when she poured all her, all her, uh, all the, almost a year's worth of, uh, of salary of, um, or perfume to wash Jesus' feet, right? And people say, you could have given that money to the poor. Jesus said, the poor you'd always have with you. And in my view, what he was signaling is that this world that you're in is always going to have poor people. It's always going to have the sick. It's always going to have the lame. It's always going to have the blind. It's always going to have people who are suffering. Mm. Suffering is inherent in the world that we live in. And I've come to recognize that that's the, the state that we're in. It's a fallen world that we're in. And I, but I also recognize that the state that we're in is not the permanent state that we're in because it's promised that there'll be an improved state coming for those who believe. So that is how I reconcile it for me, that the, the, the glory that will come at the end is greater than the punishment that we deal with now. But it's also very hard for those. It's a hard thing to explain to people without faith mm. because it's almost like you're making a gap for God, right? Okay, there's a gap, so I'm going to fill it with God, mm. right? You know, which I, but, but my argument would also be the humanist element has no space for this, right? It doesn't give you an answer. The humanists can't give you an answer to this, right? They'll be, oh, well, we're a result of our environment. Well, so if I'm a result of my environment, then you can't blame me if I shoot someone in the head for free, right? Like, because I want to, right? Like, what, what is that? Who defines what's right and what's wrong, mm. right? If I'm just a random element of what I've become, right? Like, I can do whatever I want. And how can you lock me in jail for something that's part of my nature? So I actually think the humanist angle or the non-spiritual angle actually doesn't give you answers. It gives you, it, it puts you more in a sad state of affairs and a more degenerate state of affairs than anything else, in my view. You told me you were diagnosed with some health issues about a year ago. Yeah. What happened? So I believe about, when was this? I believe during the time, this was, this was in 2000 and 2018, I believe. I went to the doctor to do, to dentist to do a, a procedure on my tooth. And when they put me on the, when they're about to basically start the procedure, they measured my blood pressure. And they told me, oh, your blood pressure is high. It's like surprisingly high. And so sometimes it happens with people because they might be a bit panicky. And truthfully, I was kind of worried about to stick a big needle in my mouth. So I calmed down a bit. Five minutes later, it was fine. I went to the doctor and they said, you're okay. But lo and behold, literally seven months ago, went to the doctor because I, I was getting headaches. 
and I said, you got high blood pressure, which was a shock to me. Um, I did not know my dad had high blood pressure. He had not told me. So it's certainly something hereditary, but he's con he's controlling with medication. He's actually doing some herbal stuff. That's He's off medication now, and the herbal stuff has actually helped him, and he's actually clear now. So I've started... Um, I started on blood pressure medication and take more care of myself, do more cycling, more boxing, more running. So health has become like a very focused part of my, of my routine. I don't just take good health for granted anymore. Mm. I think we can get in positions where we get lazy and like, oh, you're blessed with good wealth. You, you feel good. So obviously everything's fine. You have to actually work for it. So now I have to work to have good health. And I think that is a new part of my brain that I never had before. I think I'm 42 years old now. So... Um, I've got to take a lot more care of my body. What are the risks of high, high blood pressure? Strokes, strokes, heart attacks, all sorts. I got all sorts of scans and luckily everything was good. So it's not to the point where it started to damage organs and things like that. Um, but it's now in a good level. Mm. And I monitor it on a, well, I should monitor it more than I should, but I monitor it now more regular than... Um, Uh, very regularly, I'd say, just to make sure I'm always keeping ahead. So my wife is always asking, do you check your blood pressure today? <laughs> just to make sure, you know. One of the reasons you brought up for being more careful about your health is actually not you, but your kids. Yes. How does having kids change a person's way to look at life and at themselves? Yeah, once you have children, like the perspective of what matters in life drastically changes right um it becomes all about looking after somebody else rather than yourself like you you start to find muscles in yourself that's less selfish focus on other people like these good characters start to come out i think that's one of the definitions of spirituality also yeah if you don't look at the religious way yeah it's thinking outside of yourself right correct i actually i actually agree with that I think it, it really forces, and again, this isn't, um, for those who don't have children, I hope you don't read it as you have to have children to have this element of life because it's not true. But I, I certainly can see that those qualities certainly are magnified in a parent. I've seen it for myself, right? Like I'm less greedy. <laughs> I'm more forgiving, right? I'm more loving. I'm more patient, right? Um, these real good qualities that I have to do for my children because there's no, like, a child's not going to understand. I've got to be more patient with my child. Mm. I've got to be more loving with my child. I've got to be more caring about my child. I need to be here long enough so my child, actually my child grow up. So for me, maintaining my health, because I want to be able to see my kids get married. I want to be able to see them fall in love. I want to be able to see them do well in school and everything else, right? So my life starts to circle really around them and less around me, you know? I think that's the element that I really... Um, I'm really loving to see uh, with my children. I, my my daughter is nine now. My son's 11. And it's been phenomenal. That's why I hate going on business trips because I miss them so much. Mm. Um, I think I try to limit the amount of days I'm away. I try to get back before the weekend so I can spend time with them as well. But no, it's life priorities changes, man. There's a tradition on how we kind of close these conversations on this podcast. I always ask the same question. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? In regards to the election? <laughs> in regards Anything. to crypto? Um, I, 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 so we've been on record saying that the biggest use case for crypto that has ever been seen is going to be seen early next year with SWE. Think about whatever partner you think is huge, double that or quadruple that multiple ways. Like we're going to actually see mass crypto adoption for the first time. I think SWE is going to do that. We're working on some really amazing things now. Um, but we these are this has always been a goal for us and we're very, very excited about that. But beyond that as well, I think... Um, I, I do think that things will settle down from a regulatory point of view for the industry. I think that clarity will not be there next year, but I think the environment will be a lot less hostile. Um, whether it's a change in the regards of the, from a politics point of view, I think that's actually going to be great because we see both sides, both the Biden and um, 
the Harris administration are certainly way more friendly to crypto. Whether or not they believe long term and it's more opportunistic thing, I think they're you're going to realize a lot of the youth actually care about what they think about um, the crypto space as a whole, and they're both playing to that to a large degree. So I think it's going to be I won't say clear water for crypto, but I think it's going to be certainly less hostile environment to do crypto to a large extent. So I, I'm looking forward to that. I think next year will be the year for crypto. You know? Next year is the year. Next year is the year. Thank you so much for doing that, man. That was a really, really great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime.